WFLA now will begin momentarily. WFLA now will begin momentarily. Breaking news on WFLA now. Here is J.B. Buno. Well, the lawsuit filed by Gabby Petito's parents see the addition of a third defendant. A Florida judge will hear arguments in this courtroom moments from now on whether to add laundry family attorney Stephen Bertolino to the lawsuit against his clients ahead of the looming jury trial scheduled for uh, scheduled for later this year. We're live on WFLA now with a hearing from inside the courtroom and the very latest. Good morning to you folks. JB here with you live on WFLA now. This is inside the Sarasota County courtroom where you can see the signal just went live moments ago and we'll go here live to show you full screen. There is attorney, uh, we're going to go farthest from us. Uh, there is attorney Matthew Luca who represents his clients, Chris and Roberta Laundry, not present uh, to his right and seated at the table in the foreground here, attorney Pat Riley speaking with his clients, Nicole Schmidt and Joe Petito, the parents of Gabby Petito. The purpose of today's hearing is to determine whether or not attorney Stephen Bertolino will be added as a co-defendant, a third defendant in the lawsuit filed by Nicole Schmidt and Joe Petito here in Sarasota County, Florida against the laundries for intentional infliction of emotional distress. In essence, what this lawsuit claims is that Gabby Petito's parents accused the Laundries of knowing that their daughter was murdered, knowing that their daughter was dead, and doing nothing but issue a statement, a statement that, of course, we have been reporting on for uh, many, many months here on WFLA now. So this hearing will be getting underway momentarily. As I understand it, they are working through an audio uh, problem at the moment. So they're going to be getting audio here momentarily. We should be able to listen in tapping into the courtroom's audio system as we hear arguments from both sides. Attorney Matthew Luca will make an argument on why this motion should be dismissed. Pat Riley for the Petito and Schmidt family will make a argument on why this motion was filed in the first place and why it should be granted. Judge Hunter W. Carroll is expected to make a ruling on whether attorney Stephen Bertolino, not present in the courtroom today, uh, will be added as a co-defendant. Let me also remind our audience that there is a virtual component to this hearing. There is a Zoom call that cannot be streamed. Uh, we anticipate Stephen Bertolino to be on that call. And as we hopefully get audio in here momentarily, we'll be listening in here on WFLA now, and I will try to pass along updates if the audio does not come through. You can see that we are having a signal breakup issue, so stand by as we get things sorted out here live from Sarasota County. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm I'm Judge Brewer. Um, we're on the record for case number 2022-CA-1128, Joseph Petito and Nicole Schmidt versus Christopher Laundry and Roberta Laundry. 
And we are noticed for today on plaintiff's motion for, uh, for leave to file a second amended complaint that appears on the docket at number 60. And would counsel please introduce themselves. Good morning, Your Honor. Patrick Riley for uh, Joseph Petito and Nicole Schmidt. Hi, Mr. Riley. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Matt Luca on behalf of the defendants, Christopher and Roberta Laundry. It's Luca. Luca, L-U-K-A. Yes, ma'am. Okay, ma thank you so much. Nice to meet you both. Nice to meet you. All right, um, and Mr. Riley, your clients filed the motion, so I'm going to let you get us started off. Thank you, Your Honor. I, I'll actually be brief because I think I'll then defer to counsel and I'd like to respond to, to what he argues. I mean, as the court knows, uh, Florida allows very liberal amendments to pleadings, um, and uh, the, the, the cases say uh, the court should err in favor of allowing the pleading. We're, I'll address all my responses to Mr. Luca, um, if it's all right with your court, uh, with your honor, after he makes his argument. But I think the cause of action, we're simply moving to add another party. Okay. Sir, if you'd like to respond. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, and we certainly don't agree, uh, disagree with Mr. Riley that Florida does have a liberal uh, amendment policy. Um, that, that, that is, that's certainly the case. However, um, that policy is not absolute and that the plaintiffs are always entitled to amend. In this case, they want to add the defendant's attorney, Stephen Bertolino. He's an attorney in New York, and he represented them uh, throughout the investigation that preceded this litigation. Um, Your Honor, there's, there's, three, there's three factors that the court can consider in determining whether to allow a plaintiff to amend. Uh, one is whether the privilege to amend has been abused. Uh, the second is whether the amendment is futile. And the third is whether there's prejudice to the defendants. Uh, with regard to whether the privilege has been abused, now we're, we're certainly not asserting that um, the plaintiffs have filed too many complaints or they've unreasonably amended in the past. Our position is that they unreasonably delayed in filing this request to amend. Uh, the deadline to file amendments um, and to add parties was August 26, 2022. Uh, the plaintiffs waited about three months to file the instant motion for leave to amend. Uh, and the plaintiffs have had everything that they needed to amend since the inception of this case. Um, essentially, the, the crux of this case is based upon a statement by attorney Stephen Bertolino uh, that appeared in the original complaint. Uh, and that statement was a focus of the party's arguments at the hearing on the motion to dismiss, which was several months ago. Um, nothing has changed. Uh, and in fact, at the, uh, at the hearing on the motion to dismiss, plaintiff's counsel commented that the only reason that Mr. Bertolino is not a defendant is because he lives in New York. Uh, and that, that fact certainly hasn't changed either. Um, so this really isn't a situation where new facts have come to light during discovery or that Mr. Bertolino was unknown or his statement was unknown. The plaintiffs had everything they needed to amend prior to the deadline for amendments. Now, now the defendants recognize that this case hasn't reached the summary judgment stage or the trial stage at, at this point, and that discover, discovery is still ongoing. So it's not as though there's some insurmountable time crunch that the parties have to deal with. Uh, none the, nonetheless, um, the defendant should be able to rely upon the deadlines that the court set, uh, particularly for something as important as adding a defendant who, who is also their attorney. Now, Your Honor, turning to the, uh, the factor um, as to whether or not the amendment would be futile, um, the plaintiffs here have alleged an intentional tort. Um, and, that, and that's important because the plaintiffs have alleged that Mr. Bertolino's liability rests on the fact that he was acting as the agent for the laundries, as their attorney. Um, but they have also alleged that each of the three defendants, including Mr. Bertolino, acted willfully and maliciously in making the statement. Now, that's not surprising because a cause of action for intentional infliction of emotional distress does require uh, a deliberate act, de deliberately inflicting emotional distress. And, and in fact, uh, it's not even enough that a defendant acted with an intent which is tortious or even criminal, um, or that a defendant intended to inflict emotional distress, or even that the defendant's conduct can be characterized by malice or a degree of aggravation which would entitle the plaintiff to punitive damages for another tort. 
Rather, liability is established only where the alleged conduct is so outrageous in character and so extreme in degree as to go beyond all possible down, bounds of decency and to be regarded as atrocious and utterly intolerable tolerable in a civilized community. Now, the plaintiff's amendment claims that the laundries individually and Mr. Bertolino individually acted with this heightened mental state. If, as the amended complainant alleges, Mr. Bertolino was simply acting as the agent of the laundries and doing what they instructed him to do, then he certainly wouldn't have this mental state. That seemed to be the position that the plaintiffs took at the motion to dismiss. Uh, on the flip side, if Ms. Mr. Bertolino did have this heightened mental state and the laundries were relying upon his advice as their attorney in issuing this statement, then they could not have had this heightened mental state. Mr. Bertolino would have stepped outside his role as an attorney so the, the, so the laundries couldn't be liable in, in that circumstance. At the hearing on the motion to dismiss, the court found that Mr. Bertolino's knowledge and intent were essentially irrelevant because he was acting as their agent when he made the statement. If Mr. Bertolino is a defendant and he's alleged to have acted with that heightened mental state, then that changes the equation quite a bit with regard to the liability of all the parties. Um, of course, we don't agree with, with the plaintiffs that Mr. Bertolino's statement was outrageous. And our position is that neither the Laundries nor Mr. Bertolino had the intent to inflict emotional distress. But even if we assume for the sake of argument um, that the statement was outrageous, it's implausible that all three of the defendants would have had that heightened mental state given their respective roles with regard to issuing that statement. Uh, this is not a case where there's alleged to be a conspiracy or some collusion in some way for them to issue this statement uh, with an intent um, to inflict emotional distress. Your Honor, also with regard to the futility argument, we've um, raised the, the Florida's litigation privilege. Now, now, the litigation privilege affords absolute immunity to statements that are made during a judicial proceeding. Um, in in Fritovich versus Fritovich, the Florida Supreme Court recognized a qualified immunity for statements made to police in a pre-indictment context. So the Florida Supreme Court has extended the litigation privilege outside of the litigation context to include other statements if, if they're sufficiently connected. Um, there are a couple other cases that we cited in our brief. Ainge, uh, which was with regard to statements made to a judge uh, during a, a, the search warrant context and, and obtaining a search warrant. Robertson, uh, which were statements made to uh, the insurance commissioner and Delmonico, which were statements made in, during an informal investigation uh, while litigation was pending. Um, it, it's, our, it's our position that Mr. Bertolino's statement was made in response to requests from law enforcement for comment. Um, so so we would, we, our position is that the litigation privilege would cover it, even, even a qualified privilege. Uh, I'd also like to point out that ABA Model Rule of Professional Responsibility 3.6 subsection C provides that a lawyer may make a statement that a reasonable lawyer would believe is required to protect a client from the, from the substantial undue prejudicial effect of recent publicity not initiated by the lawyer or the lawyer's client. Um, keep in mind that at the time of this statement, uh, Mr. Bertolino was also representing Brian Laundry, um, who was unquestionably under investigation for murder, um, and that there was an incredible amount of media attention. So, so we would assert that if Mr. Bertolino is permitted by the rules of professional conduct to make such a statement, then the litigation privilege should extend, should extend to such a, such a statement and, and shield it from, from litigation. Uh, lastly, Your Honor, with regard to the prejudice to the laundries, um, Mr. Bertolino has been their attorney since the inception of this investigation. He's still their attorney. Um, and he owes them all the, the duties that an attorney would normally owe to a client, uh, including communication, confidentiality, lawyer, uh, loyalty, and such. Uh, and if he's a co-defendant, he can't fulfill those duties. This is not a, a more typical situation as the plaintiffs asserted in their, in their brief where an attorney and a client um, are sued together because they're alleged to have conspired in some way um, to commit a crime or some other act. And in fact, you know, their, their communications in such a context um, wouldn't even be protected because the crime fraud exception to the attorney-client privilege would, um, 
would, would effectively do away with any protection. Th this is a novel situation where an attorney's rather benign statement is alleged to have been made with the intent to harm the family of the victim of a crime that was not committed by these defendants. Um, so it is a very, very unique and novel situation that the plaintiffs are try trying to bring here. It also can't be um, ignored that Mr. Bertolino's representation of Brian Laundrie um, put him in a position to, to have far superior knowledge of the facts and circumstances of what occurred um, than, the, than the defendants in this case, the Laundrie parents. Um, that, that, that certainly it doesn't, uh, it can't go unnoticed. You know, essentially adding Mr. Bertolino here as, 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 as a defendant puts the attorney-client privilege and Mr. Bertolini's other, uh, other duties to the defendants squarely at issue. Not just his duties to the laundry parents who are the defendants in this case, but also his duties to Brian Laundry. Um, even though Brian Laundry is deceased, the attorney-client privilege res with respect to his statement survives. Um, now, Your Honor, Mr. if Mr. Bertolino were added as, as a defendant here, both he and the laundries would have an interest in defending themselves. And that defense could potentially be to the detriment of each other, um, depending on what positions they were to take in the litigation. And uh, plaintiffs effectively want to invade the attorney-client privilege by putting Mr. Bertolino in an untenable position where he would want to defend himself and potentially use attorney-client privilege information, but he can't. And on the flip side, my clients may not want to use that attorney-client privilege, but they're in a put, put in a position where they would have to waive that, that attorney-client privilege just so Mr. Bertolino could, could defend himself, just so he could present a defense. Otherwise, they'd be in a situation where essentially they would have a, a co-defendant sitting at the table who couldn't speak, who couldn't defend himself. Uh, it, it, would be, it would be an incredible, awkward, and odd trial if that were the case. Uh, th the, the attorney-client privilege is a foundational principle in our legal system. Enforcing a conflict over that privilege by adding Mr. Bertolino as a defendant would violate the public policy behind that privilege. As stated before, plaintiffs allege Mr. Bertolino is only liable because he was acting as the agent of the laundries, that acting as their attorney. If he didn't personally have the intent to intentionally do harm, then he shouldn't be a defendant. The laundry should be able to defend this case without worrying whether their attorney is going to take a position that is antagonistic to them or, or, or that somehow they, they wouldn't have the full, um, they, they wouldn't be able to avail themselves of all the duties that Mr. Bertolino owes them because of his situation as a co-defendant. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. Um, Mr. Riley. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. I kind of felt like I was listening to an argument on a motion to dismiss, um, not on a motion as to whether or not a complaint should be amended. And it, and it sounded more to me like Mr. Luca was representing Mr. Bertolino than he is representing the laundries. I think none of that has any relevance to, to what's before the court today. Again, as I said, it's the public policy of the courts in Florida to freely allow amendments, except in three instances, as counsel pointed out. And I'll address whether or not the privilege has first been abused. Counsel didn't argue that the privilege has been abused. He simply said we're beyond the date where the um, deadline was set to uh, file an amendment to the complaint or to amend the pleadings. It's important to note that the pleadings in this case weren't actually closed until I believe it was July 15th of 2022 when the answer to the complaint was filed and the deadline to file an amended complaint was I believe in August. So, the pleadings were just barely closed at the time that deadline came up. And maybe we should have filed uh, earlier to join him, but I don't think the fact that, that a deadline to file a pleading, to or, or an amendment to the pleading came and passed is abuse uh, when you're considering whether or not to allow the amended complaint to be filed. Um, we could file a complaint against Mr. Bertolino separately uh, and then asked to have the, the, um, the matters joined for purposes of trial uh, and for discovery. So I, I don't see how that there has been an abuse uh, by the 
failure at this point in time, or up until now, to request that he be joined. There's been no depositions. There's been minimal uh, uh, paper discovery that has been exchanged. Uh, and large a, a part of the problem in this case is there was a, a FOIA request filed with the federal government back in the summer of 22, I believe it was, or maybe even earlier. And we've been waiting for that information and we still don't have it. So discovery really can't move forward in terms of depositions until uh, we have that information. So there's really no delay being caused by the filing of this motion. Secondly, addressing the issue uh, of whether or not the amendment would be futile, the, the courts have held that proposed amendments are futile when they are not pled with sufficient particularity or are insufficient as a matter of law. And I cited the court to the case of Thompson versus Bank of New York, which affirmed the trial court's denial of a motion to, uh, to amend because the allegations of fraud were conclusory and lacking in any real allegations of ultimate fact showing fraud such that the proposed amendment pleading, the amended pleading was insufficient as a matter of law. Council hasn't suggested in this instance um, that the amended complaint hasn't been pled with sufficient particularity or is insufficient as a matter of law. Florida courts have held a futility of an amendment when it conclusively appears there's no possible way to amend it to state a cause of action. What I think is critical is futility uh, should be analyzed based upon the face of the proposed amendments, uh, the proposed amendment amended pleadings. And that's the case of JBJ Investments of South Florida versus, uh, Inc. versus Southern Title Group, 251 Southern 3rd 173. Additionally, any doubt with respect to futility should be resolved in favor of allowing the amendment, especially when leave to amend is sought at or before the summary judgment stage. And that's the case of RV-7 Property, Inc. versus Defani Dele O, Inc., 187 Southern 3rd 915. As I said uh, just a minute ago, the de defendants don't suggest that the amended complaint is insufficient as a matter of law because the Second Amendment contains any conclusory allegations or lacks any real allegations of ultimate fact supporting the cause of action. In fact, Judge Carroll has already found that based on these exact same pleadings, uh, the motion to dismiss was defeated, that the case was sufficient uh, to move forward on these very facts. So we're not addressing these facts again because the, the court's already ruled that it's sufficient. What we're addressing is whether or not a new party should be added based on those facts. Interestingly, the defendants uh, instead focus upon alleged defenses that perhaps Attorney Bertolino could raise. I would submit that's not sufficient uh, to show that this complaint is insufficient as a matter of law. But even if, if, if it is appropriate to address those issues at this point in time, which I don't believe it is because they are defenses to be raised, not something to uh, show that the amendment would be futile, the defendants first suggest that if, and it's their words, if Stephen Bertolino committed an intentional tort for his own purposes and not on behalf of his clients, then his clients cannot be liable for the act of their agent and the laundry should be dismissed. But the dismissal of the laundries is not, again, an issue in this case. This is not a motion to dismiss. As counsel indicated, generally an attorney is an agent for his client and the acts of the, of the agent are the acts of the principal. In a principal agent situation, the principal is liable, in this case the laundries, if the wrongful act is done while the agent, Mr. Bertolino, is acting within the scope of his apparent authority, even though the act was not authorized by or was forbidden by the employer or was not necessary or appropriate to serve the interest of the employer, unless the act was done to accomplish his own purposes as distinct from the employer's business. Again, we have to look at the face of the complaint. What does the face of the complaint say about what Mr. Bertolino was doing at the time he made the statement? Paragraph 8 says that at all times relevant to the cause of action, Stephen Bertolino was acting as the agent for Christopher Laundry and Roberta Laundry. Paragraph 28 sta say, states that Stephen Bertolino was acting on behalf of Christopher Laundry and L Roberta Laundry when he issued the statement which is the substance of the claim for intentional infliction of emotional distress. We haven't alleged that he was acting outside of the scope of his authority when he made the statement. The statement clearly, the complaint clearly states he was acting on behalf of the laundries at the time he made the statement. So the principals are liable, uh, the, uh, the laundries are liable in this instance, as is the agent. 
because an agent is individually liable to a third person for the agent's tortious uh, com conduct. And I cited the court to Sussman versus First Financial Title Company of Florida at 793 Southern 2nd, 1066. I'd also like to cite the court to the third restatement of agency, section 701, which says, an agent is subject to liability to a third party harmed by the agent's tortious conduct. Unless an applicable statute provides otherwise, an actor remains subject to liability although the actor acts as an agent or an employee with actual or apparent authority or within the scope of employment. To suggest that the claim can only be made against the laundries or on one hand or against Mr. Bertolino on the other hand is simply incorrect. It's entirely appropriate and it's entire, entirely uh, uh, proper to set forth a claim against both of them under circumstances such as this. The defendants then suggest, again, really a, a, an issue for a defense, not an, ar an argument on whether or not we should be permitted to amend. They suggest that Mr. Bertolino is afforded immunity under the litigation privilege. While this may be posed by Mr. Bertolino as a defense, it's certainly not the subject of whether or not it's appropriate to file uh, a motion or to, to grant a motion to amend. I would also um, cite the court to a case, and I apologize for not providing this previously. But this is the case of the University of South Florida Board of Trustees versus Moore. It's a September 30, 2022 case at 347 Southern 3rd, 545. In that instance, the issue was whether or not um, uh, there was immunity, sovereign immunity provided to agencies of the state. The same argument would apply here where the court ruled, when ruling on a motion to dismiss, and I understand this isn't a motion to dismiss, but I, I, there's an analogy. When ruling on a motion to dismiss based on sovereign immunity, courts are required to treat as true the complainant's allegations including those that incorporate attachments and to look no further than the amended complaint and its attachments. A motion to dismiss is not a substitute for a motion for a summary judgment. And in ruling on a motion to dismiss a complaint, the trial court is confined to consideration of the allegations found within the four corners of the complaint. Counsel has suggested that Mr. Bertolino has a defense to this case and therefore we should not allow the amendment to take place because it would be futile. But even if the court allows this to go forward, Mr. Bertolino cannot allege uh, uh, in a motion to dismiss that he has immunity because the court says you just look at the four corners of the complaint. So to suggest that he has these defenses doesn't mean that filing the amended complaint at this point would be futile. It simply means that at some point after the pleadings are closed, he may have an opportunity to address those uh, defenses if they are applicable. Defendant also suggests um, that count, that, that's the statements made in the course of a, ju a judicial proceeding. I'm going to address that issue even though I don't believe it's appropriate to be raised at this point. But correctly suggests that statements made in the course of judicial proceedings are absolutely privileged no matter how false or malicious the statements may be so long as the statements are relevant to the subject of the inquiry. There's two problems with their argument. Um, first, as they stated in their motion, we cannot know for certain what proceedings such as grand jury proceedings, search warrant applications, or other judicially supervised investigative proceedings had been underway at the time Mr. Bertolini made the statement because those investigative proceedings are done ex parte and are not disclosed publicly. Well, if the defendant can't tell us what they are, how can the court say, well, there was a, a proceeding pending uh, and therefore uh, uh, Mr. Bertolino's st statements would be protected. Secondly, without knowing what those proceedings are, how could the court determine if the statements were relevant to the subject of the proceeding? So I think that argument, although it shouldn't be made here, fails, uh, and, and I don't think that the, that the defendants have presented anything to show that allowing the amendment in this case would be futile. The third issue which is addressed, again, is one that's really interesting about the prejudice to uh, Mr. Bertolino, a lot of the argument was about Mr. Bertolino and to the laundries in this particular case. Uh, the court has said in Morgan versus Bank of New York Mellon, 200 Southern 2nd 792, a Florida 1st DCA 2016 case, whether granting the proposed amendment would prejudice, prejudice the opposing party, 
is analyzed primarily in the context of the opposing party's ability to prepare for the new allegations or defenses prior to trial. The defendants themselves in their uh, opposition to this motion have stated, the, propo the proposed amendment adds some additional jurisdictional allegations related to Mr. Bertolino, but by and large the proposed amendment does not change the cause of action or the foundational factual allegations supporting that cause of action. And in fact, there are no new allegations addressed to the defendants in this case. It's simply adding another defendant to the case. So, the, def the defendants have not cited this court to any case to support their position with regard to how difficult it would, will be for the defendants to defend themselves, whether the attorney-client privilege will be violated, and, and all of those other issues raised by them. They've not provided one case to support their argument that that's grounds not to allow the, the filing of an amended complaint. I would go back to the case that I just cited, Morgan, where the, the, there is no prejudice to the defendant um, because of their ability to prepare for new allegations or defenses prior to trial, because there are none. So in conclusion, I would argue they failed to establish that um, uh, the right to file an amended complaint has been abused. They failed to establish that it would be futile to, uh, if the amended complaint is allowed to be filed, and they failed to establish prejudice to the parties. It doesn't matter whether there's prejudice to Mr. Bertolino at this point, he's not a party. They failed to establish there's, that there's prejudice to uh, the laundries uh, in allowing the filing of the amended complaint. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, I have reviewed the, um, first off, I have reviewed the court file in total for this case, and as well specifically as, as Judge Carroll, um, as to Judge Carroll's order denying the defendant's motion to dismiss and the instant motion as well as defendant's response and uh, plaintiff's reply to defendant's response. I've heard the arguments and at this time I am going to be granting the motion for leave to amend. Um, I um, find that the plaintiffs have not abused the privilege of amendment, that the amendment um, at this juncture uh, is not futile and um, there is no prejudice to the current um, defendants um, as to their preparation for trial or summary judgment. So I will be granting the motion for leave to amend. There was a complaint attached. Um, we can deem that to be filed as of today or as of the date of the order, whichever one you should so choose. It's up to both of you. It, it doesn't matter to me, Your Honor, whatever you decide. Yeah, Your Honor, we have no preference either. Um, okay. I guess it, the only difference it might make is just the, the amount of time we have to respond. Okay, let's, um, do, so it. let's do it as of today then. And okay. uh, how much time, uh, well, you're not representing um, Mr. Bertolino. Bertolino. I am not, and no, you're you right. haven't gotten him served, no. obviously. So um, with that being said, um, we'll just do standard uh, standard time uh, uh, pursuant to the Florida Rules of Civil Procedure. Um, and then uh, if any amendments need to be made to your responses, then obviously um, you'll get the appropriate amount of time to, um, when I say you, you and your clients, uh, uh, Mr. Um, Luca, you'll be able to do that. Um, anything, uh, with that being said, I, and this may be a tick premature, but I know that you guys are set for trial for August. That's yes, my understanding. That's correct. Um, does anybody believe that that's going to happen? You know, you know, Your Honor, I was actually going to talk to Mr. Uh, Raleigh about this, you know, maybe after this hearing. Um, it, just based upon how long it's taking to get a response to this FOIA request, and, and I understand that this is important information. That's and, and, I, and I think right, we, yeah. we, both Mr. Raleigh and I, would like to see what, what he gets back there. So, um, you know, it may be a situation where we are going to need to move to extend all of the deadlines um, if this, if it just kind of continues to drag on, it, the, the latest information we have is that we'll have it by the end of this month. Yes, um, but we've heard that before. Okay. Um, so we can pause this discussion until maybe we, we kind of get together for a case management or something to kind of see where we are. Um, I, I don't want you all to be on the August calendar thinking that we're going to be going and then it not happen. I'd rather us know in advance that it's not going to, um, especially adding in a new party. I'm assuming that Mr. Bertolino is going to defend the action. Um, he's, he's here with us today on, on Zoom. 
So uh, with that being said, we'll probably want to set a case management sooner rather than later. You're expecting when, when is the expectation for the FOIA request if again? Within the next week. I would, that's we we're told by the end of the month. Okay, so if the two of you would would contact my judicial assistant and let's maybe schedule some time for a case management um, coming up here in the next month or so, just okay. so that I have a good idea and we can kind of have it structured um, going forward and, and what we're thinking. Time can we wise. can we do an early March judge give us time to serve Mr. Bertolino and then that, that's that's absolutely fine with me. Okay, I, 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 when I said. I mean, it's, it's January 24th now, so yes. I, I, <laughs> within I, the next month, early March and into February is about the same thing, isn't it? I'll assume responsibility, <laughs> so, I'll assume responsibility for getting that scheduled. Very good. And uh, would you provide me a proposed order, Mr. Riley, um, after running that by um, your opposing counsel and uh, send that through the portal? I will do that, Your Honor. All right. Anything else that we need to cover today? No. No, I don't think so. Thank you for all time, right. Your Honor. Thank you all so much. I appreciate it. Y'all have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, too. too. Mr. Riley, yeah. yes, Your Honor. you provided two notebooks. I don't know if the other one was supposed to go to somebody else. I don't know or, why I did that. Um, I'm going to give you back your other notebook. That's, thanks. I'm saying thanks, but now I have to carry it. <laughs> <laughs> A Florida judge grants the motion to add laundry family attorney Stephen Bertolino to the lawsuit filed by Gabby Petito's parents against Chris and Roberta Laundry. A trial, of course, scheduled for later this year in Sarasota County Court that will now have three co-defendants. Chris Laundry, Roberta Laundry, and Stephen Bertolino. Hello there to you folks, JB here with you live on WFLA Now. Don't go anywhere because we are getting our camera crews repositioned outside of the courtroom to uh, hopefully provide you with a uh, post-hearing press conference, if you will. It's really just going to be an interview outside of the courthouse in Sarasota County. I will say this, I'm going to begin this by saying that based on the legal experts that I have spoken to in advance of this hearing, uh, this was considered to be, of all the motions that have been filed up until this point, this was considered to be the one that was most likely, most likely, uh, to be denied. Uh, the motion has been granted uh, that attorney Stephen Bertolino, who was on this call virtually on Zoom, uh, attending this uh, from New York uh, on the Zoom call with his camera on, uh, he will be added as a co-defendant uh, to the lawsuit filed against Chris and Roberta Laundry. There were multiple arguments, three arguments made as to why this should be thrown out. Judge Brewer, Judge Daniel Brewer, who uh, is presiding now uh, in this case, uh, instead of Judge Hunter W. Carroll, who's been in previous pretrial hearings, uh, ruling that the, uh, that the motion um, and, and the arguments for dismissing uh, this motion uh, did not meet the standard necessary for her uh, to, to toss out uh, the motion to add Bertolino. So here we are. Stephen Bertolino will be added as a co-defendant, uh, really uh, sending this now into uh, really a, a different roadmap as far as what's going to transpire between now and August, August when it is scheduled to go to a jury trial, August of 2023. Uh, later this year. Very eager to get to your reaction. We're going to be featuring some of your hashtag HJB questions and comments. You heard they're very interesting as well about the depositions and about these, this FOIA request that uh, it, the FBI is uh, working on completing, or I believe the federal government working on completing as far as the FBI's evidence uh, being made available uh, to the parties in this case so that it can be used as far as the lawsuit going forward. Uh, attorney Pat Riley has indicated to me and indicated publicly that he wants that FOIA request back before the depositions take place. The depositions, uh, massive in this one regard. It will be the first time uh, that the parents of Gabby Petito and Brian Laundrie are in the same room at the same time with questions being asked. Um, it's the first time that these two uh, that these two sets of parents have uh, will see each other and that is expected to happen in the weeks or months ahead again I'm going to pay attention here to this screen down here because I'm going to hit the touch screen and take you to outside the courthouse where we're expecting to hear hopefully from both attorneys 
if they stick around. I can share uh, Stephen Bertolino did not uh, stay on the Zoom call or didn't appear to stay on the Zoom call. Uh, he turned his camera off or he left uh, before the actual hearing itself wrapped up. Uh, there was a period of several minutes there uh, or maybe a couple of minutes where he was no longer on the call. So we're going to get to some of your comments, some of your questions, uh, but I'm very, you know, I'm very eager to hear from my friend Peter Tragos. Uh, I'm very he eager to hear from some of our other legal experts that we bring here on stream. Uh, I think that this is going to be a very interesting reaction across Tampa Bay, uh, across the state of Florida, uh, because of the protections that attorneys are normally provided when it comes to pro providing uh, for their clients, providing legal representation for their clients. Um, so how attorneys in particular react to this? An attorney from New York being added as a co-defendant to a lawsuit uh, and a very high profile lawsuit at that is it's just going to be a very, very fascinating ripple effect of reaction uh, across the Sunshine State. All right, as we, oh, okay, the, the feed is popping up. And I believe that that is Pat Riley standing outside of the courthouse, our camera crew getting positioned, figuring out the shot. Let's listen in live. That? Yeah, that happens every couple of years. And she's going to be the judge throughout. As long as it doesn't go for two or three so years. They, <laughs> oh, so they wouldn't move no. you guys up. No. Okay. I, I, I thought they would. I wasn't. I was hoping they would. Not that I have any disrespect for her. I was hoping they would. Just, just for because he knew. He knew the case. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Are we up? I have no idea. Really? You might be. It's like it's All right. Okay. Okay. Mr. Riley, could you please tell us your name and spell it just for the record? Yes, Patrick Riley, R E I L L Y. Okay. Tell us what happened here today. We had a hearing today uh, because, on behalf of Joseph Petito and uh, Nicole Schmidt, I asked the court for permission to amend the complaint to join attorney Stephen Bertolino as a defendant in this lawsuit because he's the one who made the statement, uh, which is basically the subject of this, of this lawsuit. And after argument today, the court agreed that the motion uh, was granted uh, and will be permitted to file the amended complaint against Mr. Bertolino. What does this mean when it comes to when this family does go well, it means we have uh, Mr. Bertolino sitting at the defense table with his clients um, with regard to a statement he made on behalf of his clients. And, you know, when you talk about him being the agent in the situation and you talk about liability with all of this, can you kind of just explain your side of all of this, why you feel like you should be named? Well, an attorney speaks on behalf of a client, and oftentimes uh, the clients, the attorney speaking of the direction of the client. In this particular instance, Mr. Bertolino, Mr. Bertolino made a statement uh, in, in which we all know what the statement is at this particular point in, in time, hoping that the uh, that Gabby would be found and reunited with her body. And our position is that both Mr. Bertolino and the Laundries knew that she was deceased at the time that that statement was made. So that's the basis of the claim. Uh, and that's the reason we brought Mr. Bertolino in as well. Sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Um, your client's reaction to this decision? Oh, they're happy. Um, you know, they've they've been through a lot. Uh, they've had to listen to a lot of statements made by Mr. Bertolino on behalf of the family, uh, statements that sometimes were hurtful to them. Uh, and so they believe that by bringing Mr. Bertolino in, they ultimately will get justice for what has occurred. You know, I don't think I've seen a moment in the courtroom where I didn't see tears coming from. Coming it's unusual. It's, um, it still haunts them what happened. It still hurts them deeply. Um, we were talking about Gabby and her birthday earlier today, that her birthday's coming up in March, and, um, and it's a difficult time for them. Talk about where things go from here now. Um, I know you're still waiting on some important information for discovery. Yes, we uh, submitted a, a request, a FOIA request, to the federal government asking for a variety of documents based on their investigation in this particular case. We don't have them. There's a lot of documents from what I understand, and I understand it's taking them a lot of time to put together, so I'm not at all being critical of them because it's taking so long, but it's slowed down our process here. We need those documents. Both sides need those documents in, in order to complete discovery, to do depositions, and to prepare for trial. And so uh, we're hopeful we'll have them within uh, by the end of this particular by the end of this month, and then we can move on as soon as Mr. Bertolino is served and part of this case to move the case forward. Okay. And I guess just you know, with an attorney being named in this case, I mean, how unusual is that? I mean, have you been a part of a case? Like this. I have. No, it is very unusual. 
can you speak to why that's unusual? Well, typically when an attorney is acting on behalf of a client, they're, they're rep situations like this don't arise. It's just that it, it was, it's an unusual factual situation. Uh, as as a, Attorney Luca argued, typically an attorney is not liable for things that are said on behalf of a client or, uh, or are said in the course of litigation. Uh, this wasn't said in the course of litigation. There was nothing pending to, to our knowledge. Uh, and so that's why it's a very unusual situation. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Anything else that you want to mention? I don't believe so. Okay. Thank We're you. Set for August Mr. Riley? Moment, right? Yes. Hi, I'm Julie with NERD Report. I just have two quick questions for you. Okay. Um, pivoting off of your last question, did you come into this courtroom today with high expectations that the judge was going to rule in your favor? I did. The law was on our side, and so I fully expected that this was not going to be the rare situation where uh, we're not allowed to amend. I am. Okay. And secondly, was there not depositions that were scheduled for today? They were. Um, but again, because we don't have the FOIA information, I couldn't prepare appropriately for the deposition. And we don't want to take a deposition and then have to reschedule it when that information comes in. So when do you think possibly the depositions may go forward? My guess is probably sometime in March or April. And now that the judge has ruled in your favor, will Mr. Uh, Bertolino uh, be subject to um, the deposition as well? If he stays in the case, and I'm, I have no doubt that he he'll will file something to try to get the case dismissed against him, but yes, if he's in the case, his deposition will be taken. Great. Thank you very much for your time. I greatly appreciate it. Right, thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. See you, Matt. Have a safe trip. <laughs> yeah, you too, Matt. <laughs> Uh, away from the door because yeah. I don't yes. want you to get run over okay. <laughs> by people We're coming out. <laughs> Alrighty. Sir, could you please tell us your name and spell it? You know it, but for the record. Matt Luca. L U K A. Okay. So tell us um, kind of your arguments here today and can you kind of just detail what you Sure, it is unusual. Uh, you know, we, we were uh, asking the court to deny the plaintiff's request for leave to amend the complaint to add Mr. Bertolino as a defendant. Um, our argument was essentially that the, if the plaintiffs wanted to add Mr. Bertolino as a defendant, the deadline for that had passed, and so they should have done it earlier. Um, we also believe that ad, adding Mr. Bertolino as a defendant uh, raises some legal issues with regard to the sufficiency, the sufficiency of the complaint. Um, and it, the legal term for that is futility. Um, so we would expect that Mr. Bertolino is going to be filing a motion to dismiss the complaint. Um, we will also need to re renew our motion to dismiss the complaint um, just to preserve the issues um, that we previously presented and, and present any new arguments. I know, have. of course, you represent the lawyer family in this. Um, I don't know your relationship with Mr. Bertolino. Will you be representing him? Do we know who will be representing him? Uh, I do not expect to be representing Mr. Bertolino. Um, and at this point, uh, I, I don't know who is going to be representing him, but I'm sure that he'll have somebody very soon. And one thing, if you wouldn't mind just kind of elaborating in simple terms what we discussed up there, just one of the points you made talking about, you know, when this does go to trial, how unusual it is with, you know, having an attorney sitting essentially on the same side as, you know, his clients that he was representing in the early days of this um, and potentially there being some conflict there. Yes, it's, it's a very challenging situation. Um, it does happen from time to time where an attorney and a client are either charged with a crime together or are sued together. It does happen. Um, however, it is unusual, and, this, and the facts and circumstances of this case are particularly unusual. Um, now, the, the reason why it's going to be challenging for us is because the, the, the plaintiff's complaint essentially comes down to the statement that was made by Mr. Bertolino and the knowledge that everybody had, both Mr. Bertolino and, and the defendants, when that statement was made. Um, but the attorney-client pr privilege protects all of that information. So Mr. Bertolino could never testify as to what he knew uh, because everything he knew was from his clients, both Brian Laundrie and the Laundrie parents. Uh, and so Mr. Bertolino would be in a very difficult situation. And it puts my clients in a difficult situation as well because they, of course, have an interest in Mr. Bertolino defending himself. himself. Uh, they want to defend themselves. And so now the attorney-client privilege is put in, in the pressure cooker where they've got to make a decision as to whether or not to waive them. Um, so it does, it does put them in a precarious situation. We're hopeful that 
uh, the judge grants Mr. Bertolino's motion to dismiss if he does file one, um, and that this won't be an issue once we get to trial. Okay. Anything I can ask that you feel is important to mention in this, uh, where we stand? And uh, no, we're, we really appreciate the judge's time, uh, and as, as you heard, it's likely that a lot of the uh, deadlines are going to get extended in this case because uh, we've had some difficulty in conducting the discovery. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I, that happens in these cases from time to time. I, I would expect probably the next thing that occurs would be uh, Mr. Bertolino filing a motion to dismiss. Um, and in terms of the Longer family, when will we see them in court, not until trial? Uh, unlikely that we would see them until the trial. Sure, absolutely. Mr. Lupacilli with Nerd Report. How likely, how confident were you today that the judge may rule in your favor as opposed to against it? Well, of course, we always we always think that there that, that there's a chance, um, and that's why we filed in an opposition to this. Um, although we do recognize that um, in a motion for leave to an amend a complaint. Um, the standard is very liberal in Florida. Typically, plaintiffs are allowed to do it. So um, we did expect that it was going to be a difficult burden for us to overcome. Um, you, one of your arguments that you made was um, Mr. Bertolino being um, Brian's attorney as well. And you stated that even though he's deceased, the attorney-client privilege still exists. Can you elaborate on that for a bit? Sure. You, you, um, you know, the, the Supreme Court has held that um, even if a client dies, um, that the client's communications with the lawyer that pre preceded his death, um, that that privilege survives, that, uh, that that attorney cannot disclose that information. I see. Oh, thank you. Thank you all. Appreciate it. See you at the next hearing. <laughs> <laughs>I want to hear that in here actually I, you know not, the only thing that will likely happen there is we're just going to talk about scheduling dates so it's there's not really not going to be anything substantive that likely takes place um but i, I would i would ex i expect steve berlino to file a motion to dismiss um you know assuming they get him served with the complaint fairly soon you know so probably within the next month he'll be filing that and then we'll have a hearing on that so that, that'll probably be the next big hearing um, that, that'll take place in the case. Other than that... Which one is that? Th so if, if Steve Bertolino files a motion to dismiss, the, that will be the next big hearing okay. in the case. Because okay. uh, other than that, um, it's really just the case management conference. We're, all we're really going to do is talk about dates. Um, I wouldn't expect that um, anybody will be filing any other motions. I mean, obviously, stuff can come up. Um, but it will mostly just be trying to get the discovery completed, which takes place outside of you know, the court setting. Right, right. Um, but then after that, you know, it'll be so it'll be motion to dismiss, discovery. We'll do motions for summary judgment. Those will be big. Um, and the, you know, the, the motions for summary judgment, there'll be a lot of facts discussed because. That's attorney Matthew Luca off screen now, uh, explaining exactly where things go from here. And there's going to be a lot of dates on the calendar, but perhaps no date bigger so far in 2023 as the one today, when attorney Stephen Bertolino was uh, added to the laundry lawsuit uh, as a co-defendant alongside his clients, Chris and Roberta Laundry. Uh, you can hear there Luca saying repeatedly he expects uh, Stephen Bertolino to file a motion. Uh, to dismiss uh, Bertolino, not licensed uh, to practice law in the state of Florida, licensed, of course, in New York, where he works. However, um, exactly who will be representing him and how it will be, how that motion will be filed. Uh, I'll be tweeting out updates over the weeks and months ahead uh, as this, of course, takes shape and as things become a little bit more clear as we get closer to a jury trial. We're going to do an extended Q&A. We're going to be featuring your hashtag HJB comments and questions here out of the uh, social media comment section uh, but we have to take a brief break 30 second break uh, Facebook live we are going to be ending our Facebook live stream to allow for uh, some uh, other news of course other headlines other uh, significant developments happening today in the state of Florida we have to make room on Facebook for those uh, for the for that news coverage so if you're joining us on Facebook live and you want to be in part 
of our extended Q&A as we break this down. We're going to react to it. We're going to discuss where things go from here. i do a little bit of a deep dive with you interactively uh, out of the social media comment section. You can join us on YouTube Live, the WFLA YouTube page, and we'll be featuring your hashtag HAB questions and comments over there. In the meantime, click on the link in the description on this video to get to the very latest in our Petito and Schmidt versus Laundry coverage. All of uh, my reports, our team's reports, there on our website and on our app. Uh, Facebook Live will be ending this stream. YouTube Live, see you in about 30 seconds on WFLA Now. JB here with you back in the WFLA Now Stream Center. Good afternoon. We can now say afternoon on the East Coast, wherever you are watching from. If you are, of course, in the Eastern Time Zone, if it's earlier Central, Mountain Pacific, or elsewhere, good morning or otherwise to you, wherever you are watching from. Uh, JB here with you live in the WFLA Now Stream Center. A lot to get to. Um, and again, let me remind our audience in... in uh, in preparing for this live stream and in reporting on this motion, I, you know, I asked around and I tried to get a better perspective as to the likelihood of this motion being granted. And I was told that it was more likely to be thrown out, to be dismissed, that Bertolino was more than likely not going to, based on, again, the legal opinions of some of the experts that we talked to both on stream and off. So here we have the decision today, and this decision is going to be interesting as far as the reaction in the state of Florida that an attorney representing clientele here in Florida has been added as a co-defendant to a high-profile lawsuit. There's more to come, and there's more to discuss with this, but we're going to try to keep things focused on what transpired today. Judge Brewer in place now with the rotation of judges in Sarasota County. Judge Brewer um adding to the win total for the petitos and schmitz um in place of judge hunter w carroll uh let's go over this because the uh attorney uh, pat riley and nicole schmidt and joe petito they are now three for three on pre-trial motions the motion that was filed to dismiss the lawsuit altogether was rejected the motion uh to limit the scope of the depositions was rejected and now the motion to add Bertolino to this lawsuit is granted. So that's three for three on pre-trial hearings. Um, and if you, of course, are uh, Nicole Schmidt, if you are Joe Petito, you are likely, uh, likely elated with the progress thus far because you're scoring. Uh, and it depends on who is answering this question, but scoring legal victories in advance of the big looming trial, which is again scheduled for August of 2023. But depending on how the calendar takes shape and now all of these subsequent motions that are gonna be filed, waiting on the FOIA request, depositions that still need to take place, there's a lot of, uh, there's just a chance that of course this doesn't, doesn't happen this summer. Uh, it could get pushed back to a later date, but we'll see uh, exactly uh, what transpires. Um, so we'll get to some of the comments in our Facebook, or excuse me, YouTube live comment section. Danielle wants to know, hashtag KJB, have you received a text from Stephen Bertolino yet? Let's take a look. I have not. So. And I'm also being told, hold on here. I'm texting somebody back. Um, my audio made it through into the courtroom. Uh, my apologies to the Sarasota County Court representatives that work on, um, on of course, uh, just 
just to the Sarasota County Court in general, I did not know that my microphone, I was on the Zoom call, did not know that this microphone was hot. So my apologies. Very, very, um, very, very sorry I am for that audio somehow making it through. I did not know that the Zoom call was not muted upon entry. Um, but have I received a text from Bertolino yet? I have not. I was told that he would provide me with a statement, uh, depending, uh, regardless of which way this motion went. Uh, he, I have been in touch with him this morning. I asked him for an interview. He rejected uh, the interview request. He said he will not be doing interviews uh, at all. However, um, he did say that he would share a statement our way. If that statement comes in on this live stream, I'll, of course, provide it to you. I still see a lot of these comments. Uh, JoJo says, hashtag KJB, justice uh, for, for, for Gabby. Darcy's kittens, this is a very interesting question. Does attorney-client privilege apply if an attorney is only a spokesperson? And, you know, I had a really interesting conversation with this, I think, off stream with Peter Tragos, and we were talking about how, how attorneys, uh, in, in some respects these days, will act as more than just legal representation. They will act as... Uh, as spokespeople, uh, or yeah, spokesperson, spokesman, spokeswoman uh, for their clientele. And I think that this question uh, might get fleshed out more uh, over the course of really what will now be the likely motion to dismiss the adding of Bertolino, um, and, and in what capacity that he was actually, uh, what legal representation he was providing, and also to um, his involvement with the, with the statement itself. Of course, he put out the statement, um, there's there's a lot of intricacies now to this that we'll have to really discuss further and, and have to do more of a QA, and a uh, perhaps with multiple attorneys, because um, there's we're, we're getting now into uh, really interesting territory, territory with uh, the laundries being joined. Even after the deadline had passed, it was an August 26th, 2022 deadline for an amended motion past that deadline. The, uh, it was granted to add Bertolino with this uh, amended complaint. And um, now that we're getting into some, I don't want to say uncharted territory, because, you know, it was interesting that Pat Riley during the trial itself brought up USF Board of Trustees versus Moore. I brought this, I actually was reading this while he was making his argument. Uh, that was not in the court file uh, in Sarasota County. So I had to do a little research on this and, and get a better understanding of, it's a comparable case about uh, motions to dismiss. So I don't wanna say that this is uncharted territory legally, but we are getting into, when it comes to the high profile magnitude of the case, uh, we're getting into uh, just an interesting, uh, an interesting lane of conversation when it comes to um, the fact that we now have an attorney who represented the laundries being added as a co-defendant in the lawsuit that has been filed against his clients. It's it's just um, it's a it's new questions get raised by this hearing today. Donna, this is a question for an attorney. What do you think the chances are of Bertolino getting out of the lawsuit, um, given Judge Brewer's ruling and saying that um, that the criteria that the level necessary to prove these these respective arguments, the argument that the amendment would not prejudice the laundries, the argument that, uh, that the deadline was surpassed and the argument that I think most importantly that the amendment is not futile, um, that, that the criteria wasn't met to establish what was necessary for, for this to be rejected, I, I, it would be, um, I, 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 it would really depends on, on, it really depends on Bertolino or whoever Bertolino's representation is going to be in Florida, it really depends on exactly their argument as to why they should get thrown out. Are they going to reintroduce new arguments for throwing out the motion to add Bertolino in the, in the second amended complaint? Is it going to be a new rhetoric or is it going to be more emphasized rhetoric, rhetoric that we've already heard? I think that that's going to be extremely, extremely important. This is an excellent question from Stormy. If the ruling of this outcome, if the ruling outcome of this lawsuit goes against Bertolino, could he be disbarred? I, my, my gut tells me no. I'm not, an, I'm not an attorney, but my, I believe the answer to this is no, especially when you're considering the fact that 
Uh, he is licensed to practice law in, Flor- in, in New York. And of course, this is underway um, in, in Florida. But I will, I'll add this to my notes, Stormy, and we'll try to get a better, uh, a better answer from somebody more qualified to answer that question. Yeah, so uh, I think that's sexy. I think that that's what that, man, that username is. Hashtag KJB, will Bertolino have to stop practicing law while this is going on? I don't, again, I, again, I have to ask this question specifically to an attorney and, and preferably one in New York. However, I do not believe that because there's litigation, pending litigation against him, litigation that could, based on, on the, you know, the potential motion to dismiss, that the litigation... Um, is, is, is pending. So the fact, would he have to stop practicing law while there's pending litigation in Florida? I, I do not think so. I think that he continues to operate um, his law firm in East Islip, New York, and um, as he awaits the outcome of this lawsuit and really of what will likely be his motion to dismiss Ah, so Matt Bond, hashtag KJ, because the laundries claim he made the statement without their instruction. The origin of the statement itself might come into question here because it's, it is so, uh, the, the statement, I think, to most people who have been following the Gabby Petito and Brian Laundry story, the statement that was put out by Bertolino, I think to most people, it's inconsequential. I, I think that if you ask most people, even people that really follow this case, most people will not be able to tell you even what that statement said, but the statement in essence said that they hope Miss Petito will be found alive. Um, but the origin of this statement could be, could be significant when it comes to the actual jury trial itself. And, um, and now that Bertolino is added as a, as a defendant, I, I think that, that even becomes more important. Um, but we will we will find out as this as this plays out. These are all excellent questions, by the way, and this is what makes my job so fulfilling. Here, when we do interactive journalism, is that you ask great questions, and while some questions are are answerable, some are just excellent questions that we look forward to providing you with an answer to. Um, but it really just goes to show how how highly intelligent and how tuned in people are to the stories that we cover. In this case, yesterday, of course, uh, we were talking about Alex Murdoch. And that, of course, jury selection ongoing with the Alex Murdoch trial. Today, we're talking about Gamby Petito. Last week, it was Idaho. Uh, these cases, people are really tuned in, and they have really great questions. And um, I really appreciate the questions that we get. I just want to take a moment to share that with you. If Bertolino has filed any paperwork on behalf of the laundries, he's their lawyer. Right. Um, but this, this was all uh, unfolding in in Florida and Bertolino's capacity. I mean, his, his, um, he was, he was being an intermediary between his clients and law enforcement help providing, um, his clients with, with advice and guidance, um, legally and, and how to navigate what was an extraordinarily complex situation when Gabby was uh, was missing um, and then Brian was then missing uh, it was a very um, it was a very complicated situation and Stephen Bertolino acted in a capacity where he was providing legal guidance to of course his clients um, but I, I to say that you know as far as filing any paperwork on behalf of the laundries that he's their lawyer um, he's he's a, he's a long time attorney for them you know representing them legally so I don't think that anything is is in dispute as far as Bertolino being uh, the, the lawyer for Chris and Roberta. If 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 I'm I'm not sure if I if I follow this correctly, Bruiser, but hopefully, hopefully I think we're on the same page here. Uh, I do now have a statement from Stephen Bertolino. Uh, this coming in, and I'll read as follows: The decision was not unexpected. This incident, like all others, will work out in the end, one way or the other. I'll read that again. Attorney Stephen Bertolino sending me this statement in response to 
his name now being added as a co-defendant to the lawsuit uh, filed against his clients, Chris and Roberta Laundry. the lawsuit filed by Gabby Petito's parents. His response, the decision was not unexpected. This incident, like all others, will work out in the end one way or the other. I'll tweet this out here momentarily when I, when I get off stream. Sandy Martin, hashtag AJV, when the lawyer made that one statement, referring to the statement in September 2021, uh, it was the first time I changed my thinking. It gave me hope Gabby was alive. Did it for you. Uh, the, the statement, I'll share this as far as my vantage point as a journalist covering the story. Um, the statement made no impact whatsoever to me on my hope of Gabby being found alive. I was always hopeful that Gabby was found alive. Um, I was always uh, just hoping that, that the conclusion that everyone feared would not come to be true. I was trying to, I did my very best. And I, and I think that if you look back at some of our streams during that time, I think that you'll, you'll see that, um, that while every day that went on, it became more difficult for people to hold on to hope. As far as covering the story, my, my view on it was, and I tried to articulate this on stream, that I was always, always holding out hope that Gabby would be found alive. Um, that was just how I approached it. Oh, this is a very, very uh, good question. Vicky wants to know, hashtag AJB, what happened to Judge Carroll? Why is he no longer doing the case? So there's a rotation of judges. Uh, it, it's standard. Um, and uh, South... Um, the South Division or South County Courthouse. I believe that things have rotated around and Judge Carroll is now in a different division or a different chamber. Um, but this was foreseen. Uh, this was this was discussed. Um, Riley and Luca knew that this was going to happen. I, I'll be I'll be honest. I did not know that Judge Brewer was going to be presiding over. I thought that Judge Carroll was going to be presiding over this today. And I thought, and it depends on dates and and, and the cutoff, but. I thought that this was the final hearing today that Judge Carroll would be presiding over um, in the South County Courthouse. I, I did not anticipate Judge Brewer uh, being there today. So, in fact, when I introduced this live stream to you about an hour plus ago, um, I said it was going to be Judge Carroll. It uh, turned out to be completely incorrect. My apologies for that. Um, I, I was told that it was going to be after this hearing, so that was incorrect, um, that it was going to be Judge Brewer in the future, and this was going to be Judge Carroll's last hearing. And there, look, um, there were people online asking about how that was going to impact the case. There was our, our social media audience um, really read into Judge Carroll's decisions as being pro Petito, and there was this uh, social media. Um, well, it was the comment section during our live streams that Judge Carroll uh, was. Um, Look, I think judges are always going to be impartial. It's their it's their soul. It's it's the most important part of of what they sign up for is being impartial. Um, but there was this perception, uh, this observation, and this narrative established in our social media comment section that um, that Judge Carroll was was pro Petito, and um, and so there was people asking questions as to whether or not Judge Carroll being rotated out was what, what kind of impact that was going to have on the case. It didn't make um, a difference today uh, as far as um, as far as the outcome. The first two pretrial hearings went to, you know, uh, Joe Petito and Nicole Schmidt. And the third one today now with a different judge, Judge Brewer, also uh, going the way of Nicole Schmidt and Joe Petito. Quantum Solace, uh, hashtag AJB, what is the next step for this case? Um, so the next step is this FOIA request coming back. Uh, the FOIA request is uh, holding up a, a lot of um, a, a lot of how this is going to unfold and unwind and unravel from this point forward. Because the FOIA request is going to provide uh, documents that uh, that, Lu or that excuse me that Riley uh, says is, is necessary, of course, for this for this lawsuit uh, to move forward. 
So the FOIA request, Freedom of Information Act uh, request, the FOIA uh, that uh, that has been submitted to the federal government. I have an outstanding FOIA in this case as well. I submitted one. I, I'm sure that many journalists uh, have submitted them. Um, so this outstanding FOIA out there that uh, that requests all the evidence collected by the FBI. Now that the FBI has closed the Petito laundry investigation, uh, we can, of course, as journalists and, and really as, as uh, of course, uh, attorney uh, Pat Riley has as well, uh, uh, FOIA submitted a FOIA request for the FBI's evidence to be made public and for us to receive those documents. And uh, as of right now, uh, the FOIA has not been answered. Uh, I have been told uh, that there's optimism, there's hope that the FOIA will be coming back soon. How soon is soon? What is soon to you? That look, it, They're hopeful, of course, that they get this back because they can't proceed with depositions, according to Pat Riley, until that FOIA, the evidence dump, comes back. And so they're waiting for that to come back before things move on to depositions. The depositions themselves are going to be um, extremely, extremely fascinating because, as we noted earlier, it, it's – it's Roberta and Chris Laundrie and Joe Petito and Nicole Schmidt coming face to face for the first time since their since their respective children died, and so um, it, it, that day is going to be, I would imagine, I would imagine uh, extraordinarily uh, emotional, tense, um, and that's just that's just me. As far as my my covering of this story, those depositions are going to be um, look key to. I mean, really, from day one, from day one, Nicole Schmidt using any means necessary to try to get a hold of of the laundries, even going to the press saying we just want answers as to where our daughter is, and and there you see that sign. Speak up. Uh, where is Gabby? Uh, Nicole Schmidt just wanting answers from the laundries. Uh, these answers directly from the mouths of Chris and Roberta have eluded her still to this day, as we understand it. So finally getting face to face, these two families being on one side of the, of the room versus the other, and again, closed door depositions, that is going to be um, enormously significant. And I would imagine for, for both sides, what the word the correct word to use is if it would be tense um if it would be emotionally charged um awkward um only really joe and and nicole can really provide an answer as to what that will be like for them and what that will, and maybe we'll hear some some um some chatter from them afterwards as to what that experience was like Just check, checking my phone here, folks. Um, yeah, I'm being told, I'm being um, texted that my audio was in that courtroom. And again, um, if there's any sarasota county court officials reviewing our, our our stream and figuring out whose voice that was it was my voice and i my my profound apologies uh, that was not my audio i'm not supposed to be in that courtroom i'm supposed to be here uh, reporting on this uh, so my voice being in there is very uncomfortable for me and my, my my deepest apologies for that i was told it was for a few minutes it's a long time Uh, Natalie follows this story, and I know because because Natalie is asking about the Roberta letter. The Roberta letter, as I understand it, is in all likelihood will be part of the FOIA request. So yes, um, and I don't expect that to be redacted. Um, it's FBI evidence that was collected, and it, it's anticipated to be part of the FOIA. So let me explain the Roberta letter. The Roberta letter is a letter that was written uh, by Roberta Laundry, we have this confirmed from both sides, so we know this letter exists. It is a letter from from Roberta Laundry, Brian Laundry's mother, that she allegedly wrote to her son, um, and on the envelope or written on it in in big letters is "Burn after you read" or "Burn after reading this," something to that effect. 
uh, instructing the recipient of that message to burn it due to the contents of that letter. And the letter is said to contain a reference to a shovel and burying a body. Now, uh, I have had conversations uh, regarding this with attorney Bertolino, who says that this has nothing, it, it, it does not apply to the Gabby Petito case, that it predates uh, Gabby's, um, uh, it really that it predates the trip, that it, it, the letter in and of itself, I've been told from both sides, does not have a date on it. And how specific it is also um, has been called into question. So this letter and its, um, its usefulness at trial as evidence um, is up in the air because of uh, just how vague it is. It, it, it mentions a shovel. It mentions um, burying a body, as I understand it. That's what I've been told. Um, however, um, whether it specifically states language that applies to the Gabby Petito case and whether or not it is, it can be dated, specifically dated to a point in time, look, that um, you have to remember, the FBI had this letter. And as they were doing their investigation, if this letter uh, gave them enough to proceed with criminal charges, the FBI is going to proceed with criminal charges. It, it, this letter did not provide them with enough to proceed with criminal charges. So this letter, um, I hope to receive it. I'm very hopeful to, to receive it at some point, and I, I look forward to reporting on it. Um, but how specific it is and how much it applies directly uh, to, the, to the trial itself, that will be played out. That will, that will become more clear in time. Um, but the letter is, is a significant piece of evidence that is still discussed to this day. Natalie re responding back, having a little back and forth here, Natalie. Hashtag KJB bold, bold is Bertolino to claim it doesn't apply yet. I uh, won't release it like he did Brian's confession. You think if he wasn't worried, he would put it uh, out to help his case. As I understand it, the reason why Bertolino will not really, I, I asked him, I said, if it doesn't apply to the Gabby Petito case, why not release it? And he said, it's a personal, it's a personal effect. It, it, it's a, it's personal correspondence between a mother and a son. And, and he's not going to be the one to release it. But if the FBI includes it as part of their evidence dump, when the FOIA is returned, then we will all be able to see what that letter actually said. And also, too, you know, I, the last time we streamed about this, I'm, I'm see, I, I don't forget the questions that you ask. Um, people think, oh, JB brings up these questions, and then he says he doesn't know the answer, and he's going to go to find out that, that, uh, that he says he's going to go find out an answer and then never follows through with, with a response. No, that's, that's not true. I remember the questions that you ask on this live stream. Um, and there was one last time, do we know if Brian received this letter? And I was told by attorney Pat Riley that the uh, letter itself was found in Brian Laundrie's backpack. So uh, it is believed that, yes, Brian Laundrie did receive this letter. But if this all is true, based on what we don't have this letter in hand, it's been reported on and, and widely speculated um, you know, the contents of this, uh, of this letter, other than, of course, the fact that we know that it contains reference to a shovel and bearing of a body. But um, this, this letter, um, I lost my train of thought, but this letter, um, oh, I was, here's what I was going to say. The letter itself, if it did say burn after you read this on it, the, and Brian Laundrie did receive it, and if we do have this all correct, then what that means is he didn't listen to the author's advice of burning it after reading it, disposing of that letter, which in and of itself is interesting. Uh, we're going to hopefully do about another uh, five, ten minutes. Is that enough for you guys? I'm asking everybody today. I have a couple of off-stream responsibilities here at WFLA. I think that people think that my, my job at WFLA is to just stream the news. It is not that simple. I have a lot of off-stream responsibilities, work done behind the scenes to make our live streaming operation possible. Um, and I'm also going to be uh, summing this up uh, in a TikTok video. 
Um, and I'm trying to do, I, I, I promised our audience that I would be doing more content on TikTok. I'm going to be live doing a TikTok uh, tomorrow night. Uh, I'll be putting details out about that. Um, there will be a, uh, a nine o'clock Eastern live stream on TikTok that I'll be doing. Uh, I think it's the, really the first time that I'm doing uh, that kind of a format. So I look forward to seeing how that goes. And I hope folks uh, join me over there for that. Different, a different platform. I'll actually, I won't even be here. I'll be at home. But looking forward to having a conversation and, and not just talking about this case, but we'll, we'll talk Petito and, and Schmidt uh, versus Laundry. We, we will talk about Idaho. Uh, and Brian Koberger, and the four victims, the Idaho Four. We will be talking, of course, about Alex Murdoch. Um, and really, I, I hope to have a conversation with you as well about interactive journalism, how we try so much to be at the forefront of that, uh, how important it is to me professionally, and um, really hope to see you guys over there. Very funny. Team, Team Brittany knows me well and, and has seen, uh, remember, no dancing on TikTok. If I got it like a million followers, I would do it, but I'm, I'm not. I am going to be doing what I do here at WFLA on TikTok and trying to provide co meaningful content to people. And I said this, Team Brittany is referencing this, and I'm, I'm, uh, it's funny that she did. I, um, I referenced in my very first TikTok that I won't be dancing because it's just not what I do just not me. I, I do dance, but just not uh, not on TikTok. That's just not me. There are dancing newscasters and meteorologists and sportscasters out there uh, that will do participate in the latest TikTok dance trend. That is not why I'm on the platform. I'm on the platform to hopefully spread good, meaningful content, reliable content. You know, money is interesting, April, and, and I, I, you know, financially, uh, if there is a paper trail of, of finances uh, attached to this case, that could be very interesting, too. Um, much has been made, of course, in the past of Brian using Gabby's credit card, not really being the only charge that was filed in the case, um, was, um, oh my goodness, what was the charge? It was, um, the language was, um, it's escaping me, you guys. Who's going to get it first? Somebody in our comment section or is it me? The The name of the credit card uh, charge that was, it was a federal charge against uh, Brian Laundrie for using Gabby Petito's uh, debit card uh, without looking. Use of, uh, use, I remember it now. I didn't even find it on Google. It just came into my head. Use of unauthorized access devices, which is such a, um, such a bizarre name for a charge. You could just say debit card fraud, but it's use of unauthorized access devices. And I remember, because that's the, that's the official name of the federal charge. And when we first got that charge in, that was breaking news. This is going back now to when this, um, when this case was really being followed by millions and millions of people around the world. When that first came out, and, and the federal uh, documents are provided to us, and it says, uh, charge use of unauthorized access devices. I'm going to be honest, as journalists, we looked around and we said, what is this charge? We, we didn't understand it at the time. We needed to go deeper into the charge and look at it more, and then it very, made very, very clear that it was unauthorized use of, his, of her debit card. But use of unauthorized access devices was something that initially, for at least you know, a minute or two, threw us for a loop. Yeah, some of these comments, you guys, um, I, I, I like to keep the train on the tracks. I like to stay rooted in reality. Um, you do not want to hear me sing. S-Jab, thank you. Uh, Natalie, is it not a conflict of interest on Bertolino's part that he was representing Brian and his parents all at once? That, that, this is exactly part of the argument that was made today by Luca. Um, and it was uh, identified in his response as section three. I'm scrolling down here. I believe it's on page nine, and it is the amendment would not 
prejudice, the laundries. <laughs> Excuse me. It, it's it, it's laid out here, and that was um, was one of the reasons why legal experts that I talked to thought that this would get thrown out. But here we are. Another couple of questions before we wrap up this live stream. I, I really appreciate everybody joining us. Um, I'll be tweeting out some stuff later, including Bertolino's response. I'll be tweeting out um, where this case goes from here. I'll be sharing content, of course, on other platforms, including Instagram, and yes, now TikTok. Thank you guys, by the way, I, I got to 10,000 followers on, on TikTok. And that apparently, um, that opens up some um, tools for me, which is um, really great. And, and I, I have to do a little bit more research as I get more familiar with, with the platform and the creator tools that are provided to content creators. But I know that crossing that threshold is a, it's a big deal. So I just wanna say thanks because um, that helps me and um, allows me to spread uh, the work I do as far as interactive journalism. Thank you. Um, Ilani SD, has there been any update on the storage facility and the contents that also too might come out in the FOIA request? It, it absolutely could. Uh, the storage facility that, that Brian Laundry, as far as him flying home, making the flight home in August of 2021, and, um, and, the, and the purpose of that trip and, and whether or not the, how thorough the FBI's investigation was into that trip, into the storage unit and, and, its, and, its, um, and its contents, um, yeah, you know, that could be part of the FOIA. This, let me explain, this FOIA coming back, um, I, I, I'm very aware of the fact that, look, uh, as far as the Gabby Petito and the Brian Laundry story, um, uh, really everyone's just looking forward to to the trial and these and these hearings along the way. Uh, that the audience isn't as honed in on this story as as they once were, at least from a mass audience perspective. Um, but let me just share this: outside of the trial itself, there is no day bigger publicly than the FOIA results coming back, the FOIA requests coming back. And I hope, I can only hope, that the FOIA comes back to attorneys as at the same time or near the same time as it does to us journalists um, so that we can report on it and share that information with you. Um, but that data, or that, that evidence dump uh, from the FBI and from the federal government is going to be a massive look into this case and what was going on with the FBI and what they were collecting over the course of that multi-month investigation when they were looking for Brian, looking for Gabby, and then, of course, learned that Gabby had been, had been killed and that they learned uh, of the remains of Brian Laundry at the Carlton Reserve. That day is massive. There are three significant moments in, going forward now that are massive in the Gabby Petito and Brian Laundry story. One is the FOIA dump, whenever that comes back, the, the, the evidence, um, whenever it's returned. Two is the depositions, but that's done privately. That's going to be done behind closed doors. That's when Brian's parents and Gabby's parents meet in the same room at the same time for the first time since this all happened. And then lastly, the trial itself, when the trial actually gets underway. Those are the three biggest things going forward. The, the Fort DeSoto, <coughs> excuse me, Karen, I'm going to start finishing my coffee. Do you think that the trip to the to the campsite will be will will be you know exposed? I the purpose of the Fort DeSoto camping trip. Um, I know will be discussed at depositions. Whether it's how prevalent it is in the FOIA request, um, I, I'm not so sure. But I, I can say this for certain because I know, because I've reported on this and I asked this question specifically to Riley, Pat Riley, the attorney uh, for the Petito and Schmidt family. Uh, and he has said, absolutely, in the deposition process, he will be asking questions about the Fort DeSoto camping trip and um, exactly how much the laundry is divulged about the purpose of that trip and uh, that uh, that will of course, hopefully come out in time. It would come out at trial. It would come out at trial. But I, I have no doubt. And I know because Riley said he would ask that during depositions. I see you. I see you. Hi. Hashtag hey, JB. Uh, is, FBI, is the FBI investigation officially closed? Yes. Uh, the FBI is no longer actively investigating it. 
investigations can always be reopened. But as of right now, Gabby Petito, Brian Laundry, the FBI investigation is closed. And that makes the evidence gathered um, available down the line for a FOIA request to be returned. There are certain cases where um, reporters, journalists will, will submit FOIA requests and you don't get that back for, for many years. I mean, we're talking a long time and it's for various reasons. Um, but we know in this industry that FOIAs are, you could be at a, at a different station, different outlet, different job. It could be many, many years before a FOIA comes back, but there is hope that this FOIA will be back sooner rather than later. Stormy, thank you. I, I see that. Thank you. Some love here uh, for Red, White, and Bethune. Are they, in our, are, are they in our comment section right now? I haven't seen them. One or two more before we wrap it up. Carolyn wants to know, will Brian's sister be a witness? She is not on the initial witness list, but that's that list is is so preliminary that it's almost laughable. Um, will she be called? Cassie Laundry? Man, oh man. Um, I guess we will see. Thank you. Thank you, Team Bernie. What's going on with um what's going on with Murdoch? Let's check. Um what is the latest? They're still in jury selection. I think they the last I heard that they were Trying to get it down, it was like down to a couple hundred or something. Let's see. I always thought that that process was hopefully going to be done by like Wednesday. That's just, but I've, I, that is purely just my reading into it. I've, I mean, we really don't know how long that's going to take, to tell you the truth. I was just, I, I guess that was me hoping it would be done that early. Yeah, there's not not too many updates on what's going on. It's it's just the ongoing jury selection. That is the case. Um, as I've discussed previously on stream, unbelievably complicated. And I'm saying that as somebody who covered extensively the Gabby Petito and Brian Laundry case, and I'm telling you that the Alex Murdoch case is complicated. Really really complicated um i look forward to learning more than anything i'm an open book i i, I try to always be myself on stream and and, and really just have a down-to-earth conversation with you guys and i'm telling you that i'm looking the, the number one thing that i'm looking forward to as far as covering the alex murdoch trial is learning because there's so much so many complexities to the case that I want to learn and follow along with you and just be almost be with you guys in the audience. And, and I have done it. I have, I have notes after notes in my notebook. I have, I've been doing research on it and it is, um, I feel like I've only really scratched the surface. Uh, so I really look forward to the, because not all the evidence presented by both sides is really known ahead of trial. And there's expected to be significant twists and turns with with what is presented. I very much look forward to covering that in a way where we are all learning together. And I know that there's South Carolina reporters that have lived and breathed that story uh, for years and know it inside and out, blindfolded in their sleep. Uh, they just know it. Um, but I will share that interactively, I look forward to being part of that learning experience with you as we learn more about that story. I, 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 I feel confident in being able to cover it, but not as well as, as some of the tremendous journalists that have been covering it day to day, sometimes hour by hour, as it has unfolded in the last couple of years. 
starting with Paul Murdoch's uh, fatal boat crash. I mean, that was really when things started to unravel for the Murdoch family. Uh, Lauren says the potential, the remaining potential jurors from all four panels return tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> uh, interesting. Wow. Okay. Man, you guys are really kind. I'm just seeing a ton of kind comments. I really appreciate you guys, man. And um, and it was it was good for us to do a little bit of an extended Q and A here on this live stream. Thank you so much for for joining. Uh, there's a lot more ahead, not just with Gabby Petito, Brian Laundry, and the looming civil lawsuit, a jury trial that exists between these two families. Uh, however, uh, as far as live streaming here at WFLA, uh, I look forward to covering the stories that matter most to you. I want to remind our audience that I'm always reading my DMs, comments on, on Twitter, on Facebook, on TikTok, on Instagram. It is a full-time job uh, trying to do my very best. And sometimes it takes a few days for me to get back to you. Uh, I'm, I'm really sorry about that. It's because there's a gajillion ways to interact with me. Let's go over them really quickly. There are people that, that, will, that, will, um, that will tweet at me, DM me on Twitter, that will Facebook message me, that will Instagram message me, that will get my attention on, on, on TikTok or through a, a public comment on an Instagram video or an Instagram reel. Um, there's email. <laughs> there's people who call the station to talk to me. Uh, and uh, that's, that's very difficult. And I, I encourage you not to call the station uh, because it's very difficult to get a hold of me at the station when I'm, of course, extremely busy and many times, oftentimes on stream here with you. But um, if, if you message me or you try to get my attention um, and it takes several days for me to get back to you, um, it, it's not because I'm ignoring you. It's because I try to get to those DMs, those comments, those tweets um, as quickly as I can. But it's so difficult uh, in the year 2023 when there's a gajillion platforms all with multiple ways to access people. So I do my very best as far as trying to be accessible and listen to your story requests, your ideas, your questions. I, I try to be as accessible as any journalist out there. Uh, my reporting, uh, I have to get to now uh, completing my report on WFLA.com, the WFLA app. That's on, of course, uh, on our website, on our app, and you can click on the link in the description on this video uh, to our moderators on YouTube Live. Perhaps you can point um, our, our, our commenters here, our viewers, uh, to that short link uh, if they want to read the very latest. That is a story that will be updated over the course of the afternoon. Uh, additionally, here in the WFLA Now Stream Center, um, again, I'll be paying attention to my various platforms, uh, uh, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, Facebook, all of them. Of course, you can also click on the like uh, button, the, uh, the subscribe bell uh, here on YouTube Live for more content if you're looking for it on YouTube Live. And yes, uh, on TikTok, I'm going to be trying to do a live stream really for the first time uh, tomorrow night. Uh, that's Wednesday night, the 25th uh, at 9 o'clock and, and trying to have... A different, uh, a different style of conversation with you guys on a different platform. So I really hope that you join us over there on my at WFLAJB on TikTok. So a huge thank you to our moderators, as always, for joining us here on stream and to our entire audience using hashtag AJB, asking questions, participating in interactive journalism. Thank you so much. The very latest on this story and all of Florida's biggest headlines, breaking news, and the latest developments on WFLA.com, the WFLA app.